Bibles this morning, and we're going to continue this little short series on the Christmas story, what the story is about, the story of Christmas. We're going to deal with this today and next Sunday, and then on Christmas Sunday morning, we are going to have a special day where um, we bring the children up, and they were going to help help in telling the uh, the message that morning, and they'll be coming up here on the platform with me. So look forward to the kids being with me up here. Luke chapter one, we're going to look at the book of Luke, book of Mark, book of John, and you, they're all right there together. You can turn quickly if you want, or the words will be on the screen. But let me read them to you. We start off in Luke chapter 1, verse 26. It says, Now in the sixth month, angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, And considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. That's in Luke. When you go to Matthew chapter 1, Matthew chapter 1, it says this. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she found she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins." And then when you go to John chapter 1 and verse 1, it simply says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was what? Word was God. Okay? But then when you drop down and you go to John 1, 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we behold His glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Those Text that we just read contained the story of Christmas as to the announcement. Angel, but the angel made to Mary concerning Jesus. The angel made to Joseph concerning Jesus. And then the words of the Gospel of John about Jesus. In other words, what his name would be and the purpose of his coming and what the story of Christmas is all about. Now, last week, we got into this a little bit. We talked about the story of Christmas, what it entails, and we talked about God's involvement, that the story of Christmas is really about God's involvement in our life and and how God identifies with us in our suffering. Because, again, a lot of people, as C.S. Lewis said in his book Chronicles of Narnia, that um, it seems more like winter than Christmas, and that's how a lot of people are. It seems like it's more winter. And it is Christmas. And we ask the question, why is there so much suffering? We see peace on earth, goodwill towards men. Why are all the suffering? Well, the, I, the, the, one of the reasons of Christmas is that we see God's involvement in, in, in our life in the area of suffering. And we looked at that last week. That one of the reasons why there is suffering in the world is, one, because of the nature of God, because he wants us to love him. The Bible says God is love. And if he gave us the ability to love him, then we have the ability to do what? Just the opposite of that. He could have made us all robots where we just kind of walk around, I love you, I love you, and obey, punch a button, and we do what he says. But he didn't make us that way. He made us with the ability to love him. And if we have the ability to love him, then we have the ability to say no. When when someone's sitting in front of the uh, computer screen, they have the temptation to go to a site they should not go to, and they have that choice. I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to rather love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so there is that ability to choose right and to choose wrong, and God wants us to choose him. God wants us to say, Lord, I love you. But because he gave us that ability to say that, then there's also evil in the world. So because of the nature of God, God could have just said, hey, no more suffering, no evil. I'll make everybody used to be robots and say, okay. Another reason there's suffering in the world is because of the nature of man. 
we were born sinners. Another reason for the nature, for the for, for suffering of the world is because, again, when creation, the nature of this world, because when, when at the fall of man, not just the creature was, was affected, not only were we affected by sin, but creation itself. And that is why there are tsunamis and earthquakes and tornadoes and all these things. That's why there's thorns on rose bushes. Well, that's why all of these things are happening because of the fall of man. In fact, again, God points out in the Old Testament that the reason eight people died when the temples, when the towers in Siloam fell was not because of their sin, but because we live in a fallen world. Bad things happen to good people. But we talked about how does God respond to our suffering? Well, first of all, God responds to our suffering by allowing us to learn. <laughs> Sometimes he just steps back and says, you need to go through this. I'm going to let you learn from this. But while you're learning and while you're going through the suffering, I'm with you. I'm not going to leave you alone, but I'm going through it with you. And, and there's lessons that we learn in our suffering that maybe we would not learn if we hadn't gone through those. And so God, why? where is God in this? Well, he's allowing us to go through it because we need to learn. Then also we learned last week that another reason that... Um, how does God identify with us and what is God doing about our suffering is, the, is what this is about right now, Christmas. That he sent Christ to be born to identify not only with the suffering that we go through in this life, but they ultimately die on the cross for our sins to deal with that which could come in the future for those who don't know him. So he sends his son. That's what Christmas is about. He sent Christ to deal with our earthly suffering and to deal with the payment of sin. But then, also, we said he deals with the suffering by indwelling us and empowering us. It's Emmanuel with us and the fact that we are now his hands and feet. And he deals with suffering by wanting his people, his, his servants, his children to minister to others. So that when something bad happens and somebody says, well, where is God in this? We look around and say, well, he's right there. He's right there. He's right there. He's working through his people and being his hands and his feet and meeting the needs of people who are suffering. So the first thing about Christmas is that it's God's involvement. But today, we're going to deal with this part of the story, and it's the story of sacrifice. I love the fact that the song we just sang, We Three Kings, the last verse of that is about his sacrifice. Because it is the story of sacrifice. It's God sending his son to become the sacrifice for us. Because the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is what, folks? Death. The wages of sin is death. We are all sinners. Our sin puts us under a curse. And yet, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, it says, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Jesus was born. He lived a perfect, sinless life in order to die for our sins, to be sacrificed in our place, to pay our debt, to pay our sin. You know, in the world today, um, babies are born at the rate of 140 million per year in the world. It's 140 million babies born in the world a year. That's four every second of every day. That's a lot of babies born in the world. But I got to tell you this, not one of them, not one of those 140 million babies are born with the purpose of dying for the sins of the world. Yes, every baby is going to die just like we one day will all die, but not one of those babies is born with a purpose of dying on the cross to be a sacrifice for our sins. Not one, only Jesus. So when we sing about the babe in the manger, oh, we love the baby in the manger. Away in the manger. We, you know, we love that. The world loves it. They made millions of dollars off of singing Silent Night and Away in the Manger. But what they don't stop to realize is that baby grew up to live a perfect, sinless life, to die on the cross for our sins, to be our sacrifice. 
There's another passage of Scripture. In fact, I'm going to give you several. I'm going to read through several this morning. You might want to jot them down. I'm not going to have them on the screen because there's way too many. But in Romans chapter 3, verse 23 through 25, it says this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a, a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God has had passed over the sins that were previously committed. And then it says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 through 8, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were, what, still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, he didn't say, hey, when you get all your ducks in a row, when you get your life all cleaned up, when you become worthy, when you become acceptable, I died for you. No, while we were still sinners in our sin, Christ died for us on the cross. You say, well, where did, when did Christmas begin? And we think about Christmas is coming up just in a few weeks. You've got two weeks left for Christmas shopping, folks. Okay? Let's hit that Amazon Hit, hit the stores. You only got two weeks left. You got less than two weeks because you're not going to be buying on Christmas morning. You got to be have it all done by, by the 23rd. Got a few weeks left. Christmas is coming. But when did Christmas begin? Well, for some of you, you might say, well, Christmas really began, you know, all the way back. Well, Christmas began, didn't begin the night of nights in Bethlehem. No, it started long before that. You go back to the Garden of Eden right after the fall. God foretold a coming deliverer would come and bring victory over evil. He cursed the serpent, and he told the, that this coming Redeemer in, verse, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that he would crush your head. So the Christmas story really began long before Jesus was born in the stable. Max Lucado writes, the journey to the cross in Jerusalem didn't begin in Jericho, it didn't begin in Galilee. It didn't begin in Nazareth. It didn't even begin in, Beth in Bethlehem. The journey to the cross began long before. As the echo of the crunching of the fruit was still sounding in the Garden of Eden, Jesus was leaving for Calvary. In fact, I would say this, which you would all agree with, it started before that. It started before the creation itself. It go all the way back to the dawn of time. Because the Bible says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 18, Jesus, it, it says Jesus Christ is the lamb that was slain, what? Before the foundation of the world. And this is one of the greatest truths of Christmas, folks. One of the greatest stories of Christmas It is truly the reason for the season is that Jesus came as a sacrifice for us. The greatest gift God gave to us was his son to be a sacrifice for us on the cross. Now, I'm going to give you three words this morning you can write down, put in your Bible, next to some of these Bible verses that we talk about, but they all refer to the sacrificial death of the Lord Jesus Christ as to what Christmas is all about. We sing the Christmas carols, and it's great. We put up our lights. We put up our tree. We do all these things. We have a manger scene over here. We, we will have a Christmas story. We do all these things. We sing the Christmas carols. We roll from now through Christmas. But I tell you what, the real meaning of Christmas goes all the way back to before the foundation of the world when Jesus, when God said that there's a lamb that will be slain for us. To be our sacrifice. First word is this, atonement. Romans chapter 3 verse 25 says this, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. The word atonement basically means a bringing together of those who were estranged, making peace between two separate parties making them at one again, bringing them together. And the fact is, due to our sin, we were, were estranged from God. And so it's reconciliation. The reconciliation of God 
and humankind through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. Because we need to, again, remember, God is holy. God is perfect. We are not. None of us even come close to that. And while the Bible teaches that God hates sin, the fact is that we are sinners who willfully sin in thought, word, and deed. This puts us in opposition to God's holy nature. You might say, well, I've never been an enemy of God. If you're here this morning and you've never been saved, or people outside the church who've never been saved, I'm not an enemy of God, but it's our sin that puts us against God. It's our sin that separates us from him. And more than that, you see, in essence, one sin, the person's sin, is what makes them God's enemy. R.C. Sproul says this, the natural enemy of the sinner is one who is holy, and not only holy, but powerful, and not only powerful, but just, and not only just, but omniscient, and not only omniscient, but immutable. Our sin is what puts us at odds and enemy with God. In fact, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14 tells us, we who were once separated from God, but now in Christ Jesus who were once afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of, of separation. Another verse you can write down is Romans chapter 5, verse 10. It puts it this way. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the, through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And then in Hebrews 10, 14, it says, For by one's offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So you see, the death of, of, of Jesus did away with the cause of God's enmity towards us by taking away our sin. God has always loved us, and he still does. God loves the world. God loves your next-door neighbor who, who, who doesn't know him as Savior. God loves that person. But his wrath is basically a fixed permanent attitude against sin and evil. And it's that sin that needs to be taken care of. God's wrath has been turned away from us because of the cross of Jesus Christ, because of the purpose of Christmas. Again, Max Lucado said this, ponder the achievement of God. He doesn't condone our sin nor does he compromise his standard. He doesn't ignore our rebellion, nor does he relax his demand. Rather than to miss our sin, he assumes our sin and incredibly sentences, sentences himself. God's holiness is honored, our sin is punished, and we are redeemed. God is still God. The wages of sin is death, and we are made perfect in his great mercy. God does what we cannot do so we can be what we dare not dream to be, and that's perfect before God. What the Lord did for us on the cross. And so there's atonement that was made. It's a bring together of two. And then the second word is the word ransom. And in fact, this is the word Jesus used himself to define his death on our behalf. The Bible says in Mark chapter 10, verse 45, our Lord said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to be, and to give his life as a what? What do you know? Ransom for many. 1 Timothy 2.16, who gave himself a ransom for all. Now, the word ransom is a word that was used in the Greek to refer to the price that was paid to redeem a slave, the amount of money that was paid to release a slave from the bondage of his master. In a very real sense, Jesus' death paid the ransom for us. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by traditions from your father, but by the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. So Jesus' sacrifice redeemed us. It redeemed us from the bondage of sin. It freed us from the fear of death also from the fear of life. And when we accept that forgiveness, when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ and, and we are redeemed, 
The Bible says the Spirit of God comes to dwell within us and empower us so that we have now the power to say no to sin. Sin does not have to have control over us. As Paul said in, in Romans chapter 6, he says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Christ and the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin for he has died for us. He has died as been for, for he for he who has died has been freed from sin. And then Galatians chapter 2, verse 20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live, in the flesh I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul said this. Paul said all this under the inspiration of the Spirit of God to remind us that in paying the ransom for our sin, Jesus freed us from a life of sin, and he empowered us to say no to temptation. I'm not saying Christians are perfect. Anybody here perfect? I'm not. Nobody's perfect. We're not. But when we ask our Lord to, 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 to help us to say no to sinful desires, the power of the resurrection is there for us. In other words, he has... a. We, there has been atonement. His sacrifice has brought atonement, has brought us together. He has dealt with the sin problem. His, his sacrifice for us has dealt with this area of ransom where he has paid the price to redeem us and has given us the Spirit of God to say no to those things that we don't want to do. So in review, the Bible tells us that the sac sacrificial death, Jesus was the atonement for our sin, the ransom he paid to redeem us. But then there's the third that's substitution. Jesus died as a substitute for you and me. Not only did he bring us together, not only did he free us, but he's our substitute. 1 Peter 3.18, for Christ also suffered once for the sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, in, in the flesh but made alive by the Spirit. For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. 1 Peter 2.24, Peter says, He who himself bore our sins on his, in, on, in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Folks, he died for us. Try to picture for us as our substitute. There's, there's Christ, here we are. And between us is the cross, and God needs to punish the sin. And instead of you and I taking that sin, Jesus takes that sin for us on the cross. Jesus took the blow, not us. He paid the price. It's Christ between you and God so that you, you don't get what Jesus got in God dealing with the wrath. We live in the shadow of the cross because when Jesus died on the cross, there he was on the cross, and God had to bring his wrath upon sin. It should have been ours, but Jesus took the blow. He sacrificed for us. The story of Christmas, this is the, the destiny and the purpose of the, uh, of the baby Jesus. This is why the manger has... Many times you'll see the shadow of a cross with it because that's why Jesus came to do. All of these texts proclaim the amazing truth that in his grace, Jesus was our substitute. Christmas is a story of sacrifice. It cost Mary her reputation when she became pregnant without being married. It cost her and Joseph the security of, of home during a long period of exile in Egypt to protect the baby. It cost mothers in and around Bethlehem the lives of their their children and some of their babies were murdered by the wicked King Herod. It cost the shepherds their, to abandon their livelihood with the call to the manger and the subsequent commission to go tell everyone. It cost the wise men a, a long journey and expensive gifts to come and worship the Christ child. But there is none more significant than that mentioned in the sacrifice of Jesus. When Christ came into the world, he sacrificed himself to take away our sin. He sacrificed himself in obedience to his Father's will. He sacrificed himself in order to make us holy. 
And now once we experience the Lord's forgiveness, once we understand the basic theology of the fact that, that God sent his son to die for us on the cross, when we understand what it means for our sins to be paid for, does it mean that everybody's saved because Christ died on the cross? No. But he died for our sins. He paid the price for our sins. And when we sing about what child is this? What child is this? Oh, just a baby in a manger. No, what child is this? Is that this is a child that would grow and live a perfect sinless life and then die on the cross to bring atonement, to bring us and God together, to die on the cross to free us, to redeem us of our sin, to give us the power by the Spirit of God to say no to the things we don't want to do that I'm not enslaved to it. I don't have to live that way. I, I, you say, Pastor Steve, I just, I couldn't help myself. I got involved in this, and it was beyond my ability. No, it's not. God says, I've given you a way out, and he's given us the power of the Holy Spirit because of the faith we have in Jesus Christ to say no. Can I say no within myself? No. <laughs> but I can say no and yes to Jesus by the power of the Spirit of God. Because he's redeemed me. He's brought me out. He's redeemed me from the bondage of, of, of sin. And what child is this? He is my substitute. I'm the one that should have received the blow of God's wrath of sin. Because he's holy and I'm not. I should have been the one on that cross. But instead, when I look up, it's, I, I live in the shadow of the cross. Jesus is my substitute. He took my place. So when we sing that song, what child is this, that reminds us is exactly who, who Christ is. He set us free. Now, what should be my responsibility? When I understand that and I receive Christ as my Savior and as my Lord, and I, and I understand what he did for me on the cross, then my response is that I should just, I should give back. 2 Corinthians 5.14, for the love of Christ compels us. Because we judged thus that if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all. For those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. We talked about this several months ago when we went through this passage, that what compels me to live by grace? What compels me to do things for other people? What compels me to live for him? Not for myself, but for him. What is it? The love of Christ compels me. Because of what he did for me, compels me to live for others and to live for him. Greatest sacrifice that we can do is then to live for God. Chuck Swindoll said this, no other discipline is more closely associated with the mission of Jesus Christ than sacrifice. When we stop and realize at Christmas time what he did for me and the love of Christ compels me, then to not live for myself but to live for others. You see, the story of the Christmas story is a story of sacrifice. God giving his son, Jesus offering himself for our sins. But another part of the Christmas story that is long forgotten and overlooked by many is that it's a story of sacrifice of us presenting ourselves to him because of what he did for us. Make sense? I want to I want to give myself to him. I want to live for him and live for others. The New Living Translation puts it this way in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship. It's the way the New Living Translation puts it. Let me read it again. Dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship. Christmas story, the story of Christmas, it's about God's involvement in our lives. It's about the story of sacrifice. 
And next Sunday morning, it's a story of love. It's a story of God's love for us and what that means to us. So as you go through the Christmas season, as you go from here to Christmas Day and beyond, and as you sing the carols and as you see the Christmas decorations and you, uh, all, all that's going on at this time of the year, make sure we take time to come back to what the real meaning of Christmas is all about. Amen? And you'll find your Christmas a whole lot richer because the presents, the tree, all the lights will be packed away, as we say, but the truth of who Jesus is in our life is going to last forever, all right? Father, we love you this morning. If there's someone here today who has never put their faith and trust in you, I pray, Lord, that they would do so before it's too late. Lord, I ask that you will guide us as we go through this season, that we will keep you first, that we will live for you, we will live for others, and be thankful for all that you did for us. And Lord, we do pray that if there's someone, a friend of ours, a family member, someone here this morning who, again, has, has never received the wonderful gift of salvation, we pray that they will do so before it's eternally too late. And we ask this in your name we pray. Amen.